Hey GP learners, in this episode myself and Andy are going to be talking about all the recent developments in the past week which include various different documents and letters that come through including those from the RCGP looking at the future of remote consultations as well as that letter from NHS England talking about the GP standard operating procedures, what we think about it and what you need to know about it in preparation for the coming days, weeks and everything that's going to come with it. We're going to tech enhance your primary care and learning, let's get cracking. Hey, GP Lenders. So you've got me and uh, Andy and Gandhi here talking to you today about remote consultations and the future that they have in general practice. What are you thinking about this, Andy? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm thinking about the letter as well, which uh, mm-hmm. obviously we'll be covering um, in some uh, in some in some detail um, later on. Um, yeah, it's, in, it's been a really interesting week, Andy, and I think just um, stepping back sometimes and looking at the the chronology and and when things happened is, is sometimes interesting because I think mm-hmm. the events of the week look a bit coordinated um, from from my perspective. Um, so let's just talk through what's been been happening. So do you want to share my screen, Gandhi? Let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So so actually, towards the end of April, um, we were seeing uh, uh, articles in Pulse saying actually record numbers of GP appointments or G, you know GP demand peaking being mm-hmm. coped with admirably um you know actually internally from within the profession um it felt like things were getting more difficult but we were rising and trying really really hard um mm-hmm. and doing really really good stuff to meet demand simultaneous there was or simultaneously um and let's see if i can get the sound to work here there was a lot of noise in the media about not being able to get a gp appointment um including a panorama episode so let's oh my god i'm not going to get an appointment i'll just wait and see if i feel better another day you, you can't get an appointment you can't i've got one appointment left two weeks today okay because we're fully booked so we'll stop it there and let's get my microphone back to the position but there's a lot of noise um happening um about not being able to get an appointment mm-hmm. um and then on the 11th of May, um, the Royal College uh, released um, a really good paper about the future of um, of online consultations and actually addressed some of those issues around the balance between telephone, digital triage and face to face consultations and addresses those quite head on um, mm-hmm. in that um, in that paper. Um, and then uh, on the 13th. Uh, almost simultaneous with the NHS England letter, Nikki Kanani um, has written a piece in Pulse, um, which is actually quite attuned to the messages coming out of the RCGP. Very, very similar um, in its tone and some of the content there and talking mm-hmm. about um, actually how general practice has risen to the challenge of COVID uh, very well, has adapted well through introducing uh, new types of consultation models um, and uh, you know that these have been helpful through uh, through the pandemic. Um, talks about moving forwards and working in partnership with patients to yep. get the right type of appointment for them. Um, and actually uh, almost feels a bit coordinated. And obviously it comes after the um, the RCGP uh, report, but I wonder if there's a bit of coordination happening there. Um, and then of course, uh, on the 13th of May, uh, at a similar time to that article coming out, there is the uh, the letter uh, from Nikki Kanani, um, effectively yep telling general practice that they need to offer uh, face-to-face appointments. And we'll go in more detail on the letter um, later. And then, of course, there's been um, a plethora of responses from local uh, LMCs. We'll be looking at Cambridge's response, which is um, quite a good one, we thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our local LMC response, and of course, the Royal College has Mm -hmm. responded. Um, And there's been response from our representatives within the BMA as well. So we'll be covering all of that uh, as we go forwards uh, with a particular focus on the letter, uh, but also on that paper that came out from RCGP, which actually is really, really interesting um, mm-hmm. around um, remote consulting. Uh, so, yeah, shall we get going, Gandhi? Or have you got any comments about the? Yeah, just before we do, so the- just to remind everyone that this is our viewpoints and our thoughts, and we are by no means official spokesmen for any of these organisations in terms of what they've done and how they've done things, and just a slight declaration that you know, in that respect, that we are giving you our opinions, and and none of this should be taken as hard and written law. However, we will be sharing a lot of guidance documents that you could consider how much you want to take them and everything else from that point. Um, Before we do, uh, as you mentioned, there was the media stuff that came out about not seeing your GP. And this has been a bit of a rhetoric that's been going on for a while, um, which has been challenging. And I think there are definitely some areas where it's been different. And I think that's where, you know, particularly patients have had a challenging experience. And I know many clinicians are also feeling that 
remote consultations is not something that they want to continue with. Interestingly, I was on the news about this on Thursday as well. So um, I don't know if you saw it, Andy, on Channel 5. You know, Gandhi, I didn't. You sent me the link. So what, what did you say on Channel 5? So actually, I was approached by Channel 5 to do a video log over the past couple of weeks of how things have been um, and then presented that to them. And then they edited it, you know, approximately was about 20 minutes of content down to about 15 seconds, which is fair enough. Um, but yeah, it was basically about the challenges that we've been facing, particularly since um, the Maybank holiday and how it's been. And, you know, um, for the EGP learners, I will be releasing the whole kind of stuff in due course um, because they've kind of said I can. Um, and I just need to edit tiny bits and, and stuff to make sure there's no patient identifiable information and that kind of thing in there um, to make sure it's safe and sensible and things. But that'll be coming out soon. So you'll be able to see my vlog over the past couple of weeks. And that kind of shows you how much work I think we're doing. But we're going to talk about it in a separate way later on. Before we do, let's crack on with this RCGP document, which I know has been an interesting one that came out. And, and this was actually the original focus of this episode until the NHS England letter came out. Um, so we're going to spend a little less time than we planned on this. Um, and we're definitely keen to hear your views as well, EGP learners. And I can see some of you already joining in on the chat. Feel free to do so. Stick your questions, comments, everything else in that. And we'll get to those a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, t- talk us through the document, Andy. Yeah, so we've we've been through the document and sort of annotated where we think um, there are some interesting points. Um, like all documents, it begins with an executive summary. We're going to skip over that um, as we review the document because if we if we sort of highlight the key bits in the executive summary, we'll be just repeating ourselves as we review the document. But the executive mm-hmm. summary is good um, and it is quite a faithful representation of what's in the document. What is also quite good is actually um, the sort of the article on the website that links or on the RCGP's website that links to the the paper. Um, and this is actually really, really good. So if you don't read the paper, read this and you'll get most of what you get um, from the paper, uh, but in a much shorter format, uh, including some of the key statistics that come through in the paper. So if we just move through this, this key terms um, section, I think is really useful um, mm-hmm. because even on um, EGP learning, where we talk about this sort of thing fairly often, um, we often use, I think, the wrong terms for different things. Oh, and and yeah. in practice, you know, we often do as well. Do you want to talk us through where you think some of the key some of the key definitions that we need to be aware of, Gandhi. So, so I think probably the, the couple I would really recommend people try and identify, and particularly this is in light of the GP standardization of appointments work that many people are doing. And, and if you do want guides on that, we've got some of those on the GP learning channel. But the triage one is probably the key one, because I think a lot of practices have been doing potentially triage. And it does make that point of when does a consultation, particularly telephone based, flip from being triage to a telephone consultation? Um, and I think the key thing is trying to identify is once you start doing some active management for the patient, that's when that contact has changed from being a triage based contact to a telephone consultation based contact. Um, so important to note that particular one. It does a little bit lower end down identify, obviously, telephone triage, digital triage, the difference between the two and that are the kind of routes that people be using. I know NHS England consider online consultations to be patient originated digital consultations. So another one that's not really in that document, but a specification. So, um, you know, for you to comply with the contractual requirements to be offering online consultations, it has to be patient or originated. So things like Accurix Photo won't actually quantify as a online consultation, but it is a digital consultation, if that makes sense. Yeah, I suppose unless... Semantics, but it's, all, it's important semantics because one puts you in right with the contract, the other one technically puts you in breach of the contract. That's all you're doing. Um, but then the big one is the total triage concept, because th- this is the one that every practice across the entire country was asked to do um, as of last April um, in order to deal with the issues with obviously COVID. And, you know, we were mandated by NHS England to do total triage. Now, which, which was entirely appropriate, I think, particularly yep. at, the, at the time, given um, that there was very little we could do about COVID at that time in terms of not mm-hmm. having a vaccination uh, to protect the vulnerable people that had to come in sometimes to surgery or have contact with our staff. Yep. You know, GP surgeries were, were going to be, you know, super spreader environments, you know, without without some really um, radical action. So I think that was really important. I was just going to highlight that I think the key thing here is, well, at my practice, one of the key distinctions is the difference between a remote consultation and triage. Um, because what I hear when I go into reception, what I hear the, the receptionist saying on the phone sometimes is, oh, 
I'll put you down for a triage call with the doctor. And I think this is mm -hmm. a legacy from other appointment systems we've operated in the past where we have had clinicians doing genuine triage. But now really everybody is being put down for a remote consultation at my yeah. practice. Um, and people are dealing with what they can deal with, you know, on the telephone, on the telephone. And if they can't deal with it on the telephone, they're putting in place a plan that might include a face-to-face -face appointment in order to deal with that patient safely. So actually we're, we're doing remote consultations and um, John Henderson has just put in the comments, you know, that, uh, that messaging is really important. So we've been trying really hard to get our receptionist to say on, uh, to say telephone appointment uh, mm -hmm. rather than telephone triage, because I think the patient gets a, a really, I think that does affect how the patient feels about the yeah. service that they're getting, you know, what they are told about it. So that's that's a really important distinction, I think, and I'll be feeding that back to you. I completely agree. Team. I think we do need to use more nomenclature along the lines of appointments and consultations rather than shortcutting to triage and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and appointments, I think, is the key one that we need to focus on. You actually are having an appointment. And this feeds, I think, also into some of the other stuff about you know patients not being available when you're having remote con you know, consultations with them and, and appointments. Actually, if it's missed, it's missed. It's still an appointment kind of thing. But separate topic, but let's crack on with the document. So it talks a lot about, I think, some of the changes that have happened since obviously the impact of COVID and, and things. Talk us through it, Andy. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so it talks, this section talks about the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of care. And and the big thing that we see here is, is sort of a flipping of appointment types from pre-COVID to during COVID. So prior to COVID, so March 2020, um, we were delivering 70% of GP appointments face-to-face -face and, mm -hmm. um, at about 30% via other mechanisms, telephone, online appointments, all these other ways that we can deliver care. Um, during the pandemic, um, this flipped and about 70%, 65% of appointments were delivered remotely. Um, uh, but actually still a fair amount happening face-to-face -face actually, you know, 30, 35% is still quite a lot. And that probably mm -hmm. reflects what we were doing in practice, but I'd got the impression myself and maybe this was an incorrect impression you know that other practices were perhaps seeing patients less and i might have succumbed to a little bit of the sort of mm -hmm. media mania myself there um and then now as we move into this uh, phase where we have um you know vaccination rates are becoming um quite good um covid cases are dropping um the, the, the current situation on march 2021 which is a little bit in the rearview mirror now um, mm -hmm. Actually, it was about 50-50, again, in terms of face-to-face mm -hmm. and online appointments, which I think does not reflect the picture that patients see when they look in the mainstream media yeah. about access to um, to GP surgeries. Um, so I think that's a really interesting section, and practices might want to share some of that information with their patients on their websites or posters and so forth. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and then it goes on to talk about, actually, the the difficulties certain types of practices might have faced. So I know in my primary care network, we've got all sorts of different types of practices. Some of them are pretty big, um, but some of them are quite small uh, mm -hmm. with small numbers of medical staff. Um, and some of them have, you know, um, they might be single-hander or perhaps have two medical staff who are older and in the BAME community, you know, and so they face real challenges being able to deliver face-to-face -face appointments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, NHS England have recommended that we risk assess and you know protect certain um types of staff who would be at risk so you know it's been really difficult practice like that i think to uh you know follow all the guidance that they've been given and i think they've done a really good job they've gone mm -hmm. total telephone triage i know in my area they've been um uh you know just uh, you know opening up a, a smaller number of clinical rooms but they have been seen face to face you know despite the personal risk yep. faced by those um two gps in particular and i've been very impressed they've done a really good job and maybe they've taken more risks with themselves at their own discretion than than they should you know than they than they might have been expected to um so it does acknowledge that and then this bit just just highlights i think we've said it a few times uh this total triage model was um has come from guidance from nhs england Absolutely. You know, this, this isn't something that gp surgeries chose to do themselves although very sensible um yeah I think it's important to recognize that a lot of practices were doing this beforehand anyway. There were actual consultation models that were instilled and used by practices well before COVID came along about using total triage. And in actual fact, a lot of them pertain to be the most efficient way for practices to see patients. Um, and they've kind of felt that that's been justified by COVID and the implications of everything that's happened. So I think it's important to note that this is not a new thing. 
although it was recommended, but as you said, by NHS England when COVID hit as the method to help and associate with patients as best as possible for their clinical needs and also making sure that practices stay safe. Interesting. We've got some um, some comments and engagement coming through, haven't we, Gandhi? I'm just people are uh, reflecting on the difficulties of going back to business as usual. Yeah. Um, so Stephen's mentioning about how going back to business as usual, so I guess pre-COVID and stuff, is not going to be uh, available. You know, a burnout is a massive concern, and we're going to talk about some of this a bit later on, um, and how total triage has been useful for, for particularly his practice and stuff. And then John's talking again about, you know, um, how restrictions are easing up and stuff and, and that has led to a significant upsurge in demand. Uh, we, we kind of talked about this a couple of weeks ago with our online consultations being sustainable um, uh, episode, which if people want to have a look at that, feel free to do so. It's a really good, slightly long, but really good episode. Um, and, you know, how do we convert this? Well, we're going to talk about that when we get to the NHS England letter and stuff. But yeah, we'll get there. Don't worry, guys. Yeah, so the the balance of remote versus face to face consultation. So there's quite a lot of information here, and a lot of it's highlighted. If you do want to check out this document again, the links are in the description below, so you can access all these documents. But what does it say, Andy? Yeah, so so in essence, um, it's just acknowledging that some some types of consultations are better suited to remote methods than others, and it's highlighting actually um, that the Benefits. The, the interesting thing that comes through to me here is actually a lot of the benefits are, are, are for the patient, just sort of mm -hmm. reading between the lines of online and remote consulting methods. So it does talk about the the convenience um, that actually it might um, enable appointments for people who would otherwise otherwise struggle, such as mm -hmm. um, you know housebound, where they do have access to digital technology, for example, can make things a lot easier for those types of patients. You know, and similar for patients in care homes, they're in a similar situation to that, aren't they? Yep. Um, or patients who work and have busy lives, you know, actually, it can be a lot more convenient. It then talks about actually, um, clinicians often have some some reservations. Actually, the document reads such that actually a lot of the reservations are perhaps more on the clinician side, which I think also mm -hmm. runs um, in a different direction to the media story because you get the impression looking at the media that GPs don't want to see patients and that's mm -hmm. really not what comes through in this document and the statistics that they've collected around gp attitudes and actually gps acknowledge that yes yeah, some consultations can be handled uh, remotely mm -hmm. simple presentations um and you know simple queries and questions but actually um it can be difficult to get the right rapport for difficult conversations over yep. the over the telephone where there's disclosures of difficult or embarrassing information or discussions around um, problematic uh, use of drugs or resources and so forth. So actually, and actually where you need to physically touch people, you know, and or, or pick up on those soft cues. It talks a lot about those soft cues, which we all learn yeah. about in medical school, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, it, it talks about what digital consultations appear to be useful for and what they're not. Um, there's a really interesting section about um, GP perceptions of online consultations and actually um what comes so overwhelming is is that gps appear to feel that face-to-face -face consultations are generally safer in most situations allow them to end the care with one consultation without requiring follow-up more mm -hmm. successfully um uh, so they think actually face-to-face -face is, is probably a better medium mm -hmm. um there's also uh, some data about the impact on GPs' working lives, and the majority of GPs feel that remote consultations are less satisfying and are having an impact on their job satisfaction level. Um, the, the relationship building isn't there, and things feel much more transactional. Um, and also mentioned, but they don't put a statistic to it, I don't think. Uh, it's actually that online and remote consulting, and we've talked about this before, can be really stressful in terms of the risk yeah. management. Um, and actually GPs and other people, you know, the clinicians remotely consulting um, can actually experience more stress at work, take more stress home and actually mm -hmm. can increase the risk of, of, of burnout. You know, And that's something I, I see all the time and hear from my from my colleagues. So just really interesting to reflect that actually the profession is probably more skeptical about these than the public who are probably more skeptical about these than the government mm -hmm. and powers that be who have been. Um, mm -hmm really talking up and pushing um, online access while simultaneously pushing face-to-face. -face. It's, it's an interesting 
um, approach, I think. It kind of sounds like they want an all you can eat, does everything, but not willing to resource it. That's my well, cynical they, view of it. But yeah, want but... every individual person to hear what they want to hear from them. Yeah. I think. Anyway. Is that not what government politicians do, though? But hey. Again, well, they shouldn't, they shouldn't do it with important things like healthcare. So, Not and then good. actually the final bit, which I think is really important is they say it's unclear whether patients value remote consulting or not. You know, actually yeah. it is unclear whether the patients actually want remote consulting or they don't. Um, so very interesting. Um, anyway, think, and then they talk about maybe a couple of points on that though, Andy. So I think it's important to remember that continuity is one of the key things that is not evaluated in these kind of things. Um, so the consultation route itself is probably less if, of an issue if you've got continuity. I think if you haven't got continuity, then the consultation route has more of a bearing because there isn't that relationship that's already established. Yeah. So um, a, a triage based assessment with somebody you've not met before, that patient may feel that they've not had a suitable consultation because they've had a triaging and they've been passed on to somebody else and then go through potentially a system where that, by that route happens. Whereas a patient that you know, you are more likely to have, I would imagine, a more satisfying relationship and consultation process, irrespective of the route, whether that initially was face to face and then turns into remote or vice versa. And, and that's my personal experience and stuff that's happened with this. I think the other thing that I would like to labor um, and mention, the document talks a lot about the suitability for patients in terms of the consultation routes and things. One absolutely really important point it doesn't really focus on and mention is the fact that remote consultations is actually what has allowed general practice to continue to function over COVID, particularly when the clinicians have not been able to physically be around the patient. So points of isolation have been the key one. You know, over the past you know year and stuff, we've had many situations where clinicians have had to self-isolate because they are either potentially got COVID-based symptoms or have had COVID-based symptoms. And for practices to continue to offer service, them still being able to work remotely has meant that many practices have actually been able to continue functioning in some way, shape or form. And, and that doesn't really come into the business continuity aspect of this particular document. Um, not in great detail. It's half mentioned, in my view. But... Yeah, it, it doesn't really talk about the um, the workforce flexibility afforded by remote cons consulting models. That That mm -hmm. isn't really in the document or it didn't really come through to me which, is, which is actually one of the key benefits of remote consultations the fact that you can continue to provide service when you're in a situation where you physically can't be around the patient for whatever reason that may, may be whether that's isolation whether that's due to ill health um you know i had an operation last year which meant that i had to rest at home and i shouldn't be walking around at, at practice and stuff but actually i was still able to come back to work sooner because I had remote access to the system and could do stuff to help the practice, consult with patients, et cetera, and therefore meant that I was still of use to my patients and my practice, whereas actually if I didn't have that, I'd be stuck at home doing nothing. Yeah, very true. And and, and, and in the future, that flexibility mm -hmm. within the workforce will continue to be useful with uh, you know bringing people who might struggle to participate in the workforce due to childcare issues or you know mobility issues, as you experienced, um, or estates, which is a massive problem in the NHS. Yeah, mm. absolutely. But it doesn't talk about that. You're right. No. Um, it doesn't come at it from that more business case type angle. No, it that, focuses that purely on patient relationships, which is an important part of obviously the work that we do. That's one of my key issues with this particular document. It doesn't focus on it being about general practice. It focuses about being about the consultation. That's true. It's very focused on the therapeutic element and not yeah. the business and resource case um i was just going to talk about relationships gandhi because i think i i agree but have a slightly different spin on the effect of digital consultations mm -hmm. um, on relationships because i i don't think they're good for building relationships i think you build your relationships in your face-to-face -face consultations and i think actually depending how it goes but most of the time when you have an online or remote interaction with someone often you're spending some of that relationship capital with that person and i've noticed this with um, some patients over mm -hmm. the course of the year that you have a good relationship and you can leverage that um, to um, reassure on the telephone, yep. for example. But each time you do that, I think you spend a little bit of that relationship capital that you've got that you can mm -hmm. only really renew face to face. So eventually, after several remote consultations, which are clinically legitimately remote mm -hmm. and safe, um, they're starting to want to see you again and they're wondering you know, they're anxious that they've not 
seeing you and it's almost like you need to see them to rebuild that relationship it's just yeah. something i've experienced you know i've experienced which is a very soft issue but um well the document does mention that at one point it says about you know if you've had multiple contacts with somebody through a remote process and you've not potentially got somewhere that actually a face-to-face -face is possibly a sensible solution and i would agree with that you know i think if you're like clinically struggling to manage a patient in terms of where they're heading actually the face-to-face -face is an absolute you know priority at that point to make sure you're getting on the right track and like you say rebuilding that relationship with the patient um we can talk about that in more detail a little bit later on where time's ticking on so let's crack on with the document right, let's crack on we'll we'll get we'll get through so let's just concentrate on our highlights so overwhelmingly people feel that the tools need to be better and we've spoken about this the document talks about some of the basic tools like the quality of the um actual equipment and broadband connections that people are using mm -hmm. uh, but they do talk about the software and the systems as well and i know it's something we talked about in the last episode that actually if we can get to the position where some queries are handled within the system and don't mm -hmm. require a human in the loop to make a decision and take risk um which might not be you know in the future that that may well be possible but but most of the current systems don't appear um set up to do that you know that will be a big win so i think i think there's a lot of scope for the systems yeah. to improve and people i mean it's improvement in systems i think integration is the biggest one though for most of the systems is being able to work within the various different interfaces that they need for us to have them function effectively and i know that there is work being done around this obviously the system one in emis integrating with online consultation providers in a deeper way i think absolutely needs to happen because that's going to be the, the route for you know these things to work more effectively no idea what's happening with vision and the other ones and um, apologies we don't know we just don't have exposure to them so if you do know let us know i'll be keen to hear that but yeah integration is the other part of the improvement of the software side of it and that has to happen you know i'm gonna i'm gonna make my point about zero friction systems here because i was wanting to get it in somewhere yeah, right. so what is a zero friction system then andy well so friction in systems ex exist and often you can reduce the friction in the system so um let's give an egg so i listened to a podcast midweek this is where this came from and then i tweeted um about it in relation to um to this appoint the uh, remote and digital appointment system so it was something they were talking about email and the effect it had on productivity in the workplace mm -hmm. and there's an actually before you had email um people had to send physical letters and actually there was more friction in that because yep. it was more work to send a physical letter and there was a cost often in terms of a stamp to send a physical letter to somebody or you could use the telephone but the telephone also costs as well and you have to pick up the phone um email reduced the friction for communication um both between and within organizations um and actually a lot of people who look at productivity in the workplace uh, feel that actually email is a frequent use of email um and the way people use email to um bat issues to and throughout fro and get things on and off their uh their to-do list in their plate is bad for productivity Absolutely. so that's an example of where you take a, a system where there's a bit of friction and cost for doing something often very small and you reduce it significantly or make it go away and it can have unintended consequences mm -hmm. um that, are, that can actually be, be quite destructive um lots of good things about email but a lot of places are moving away from using email and using other uh, communication and collaboration tools so um, I thought, actually, this is what we're doing in uh, with consultation models, isn't it, in general practice? Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, before COVID, we were actually talking about increasing the friction for consultations. Um, the, the, the argument some people made went, um, a lot of use of consultations is inappropriate, and mm -hmm. we want to reduce that so that we can spend more time with those people who need us and less time with inappropriate consultations. And we were talking about, well, maybe we'll even charge for GP consultations was the actual conversations we were having a few mm -hmm. years ago. Feels like, you know, a different world. Um, and now what we're talking about is reducing all friction. So practically, so you can anytime, night or day, 24 seven, pick up your phone and, you know, send a message to your GP. And, you know, I'm just not quite sure what that's going to do to demand and the systems. And I think it'll make demand go up and yeah, we've in control. It, haven't we? we? Over the past month, we've seen a significant increase in demand across the entire general practice, you know, doubling of appointments in some areas. I know we've done an audit. Our, you know, number of appointments, uh, sorry, number of contacts we've had with patients has doubled in April compared to the previous February. 
that was pre-COVID um, hitting the UK and stuff doubled. That is a significant increase in demand. And, you know, um, part of that is because people, like you say, have the lower friction to, to contact. There are definitely some additional factors within that. We're going to talk about those in when we get to the NHS letter. Um, but like you say, if you make something easier to access, you have an increased amount of contacts that are actually non-effective. They're not important because they're important to the patient. But in terms of is that the best route of doing it? Probably not in situations where that's the case. Yeah. yeah. Further, my final bit, and then my rants over again. Yeah, we, we got to get going. Yeah. The, the 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 way these systems are sometimes designed make them feel like it's it's like googling something. When you Google yeah. something, you know there isn't a human resource needed to do Google query. Um, so people think it's like that, I think. Um, but actually, and that means oh, even if it's a little, maybe you know they're not that worried about it. They think oh, I'll just ask, you know, I'll ask the system, you know, because yeah. it looks like AI is going to deal with it. And all these companies talk about AI and how. The AI driven, not all of them, but, you know, maybe look yeah. at Babylon, maybe, or people like that, you know, and they drive the public perception to a certain degree. Um, you know, so I don't think people are, are actually always fully aware of the resource implications of, of submitting these queries and the effects that they might have on the system. So I think, I think it all needs looking at, I think, okay. uh, uh, I think we should be careful on the I routes do not we head down. There. <laughs> but let's carry on with the documents. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, need for training. That's what people are. That's what people are saying, and I think that that and training and guidance and guidelines around how to use uh, these sorts of consultations that mm -hmm. sounds very reasonable. Um, they talk it more about the total yeah. triage yeah. systems, um, and uh, they're beginning to highlight actually the need that that it's unclear whether this actually has a positive resource impact and whether it actually saves people time um, and allows them to be more effective, um, be, a, be a more effective healthcare resource. Um, and they're beginning to highlight the, the need for more research, which really comes through um, at the end in their recommendations. I'm just aware of time. So I think if we get to the recommendations, which are next, yeah. uh, this is sort of the, a really important part of the document, I think. Um, and we'll just talk briefly about each perhaps, Gandhi, and then we'll get on to that letter. Um, mm -hmm. So they're calling for, this is the RCGP, so they make these sorts of calls, don't they? Um, yeah. We need to invest in um, in the infrastructure mm -hmm. and how capable these systems are and in their deployment. That's very good. You can, you can look, at, yeah. look at the document, look at the details. Um, they want people to actually look at you want to review how effective they are, you know, the systems and the processes, um, so that when GP practices, PCNs, regions are making decisions about what to deploy, they actually mm -hmm. have some idea of, 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 of you know, what's going to be effective for their, for their need. Mm -hmm. um, and also to make them, you know, to make them better and make sure that they all do some of the minimum safe things effectively um like you know highlight red flags and you know what is a what we all know what red flags are like on the telephone and you know what they look like face to face but what do they look like for a digital system you know they want to establish some of those those key sort of safety fundamentals um and then tools training access to support um for those people deploying and using these systems and obviously, if people do want to check out some of those resources you've got available, we've got a fair few on the EGP Learning Channel that you can have a look at, particularly when it comes to remote consultations. Yeah. They don't want people to be left behind who can't yeah. use or don't have access to these, to these systems. And then finally, and I think most importantly, uh, they're calling for research into um, how effective these systems work and are deployed um, effectively you know, in terms of their effects on clinical safety, um, patient experience, you know, all of these dimensions, including mm -hmm. the impact on work on the workforce and the um, the demand effects on the system. Yeah. So, really, and I think I think that's what we really need to understand what's going. And I wonder sometimes are we are we going ahead too quickly with some of these things? Once you change patients' perceptions, it's difficult to change them back. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So it's an interesting document, um, and I think there's definitely some recommendations we'd agree with. I think there's definitely some omissions, I guess, is my concern with this particular guidance. And um, we talked about the business um, continuity aspects of it and things, and, and definitely those comments have come through from other people in terms of, uh, so I know Dave's mentioned about how the states and strategy provision and 
stuff has helped with remote consultations. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting document, and I think there's definitely some good stuff in there. I think, like I said, there's some omissions as well. But what do you think, Andy? So I think I think it's helpful, actually. So I think some of the statistics in there are really interesting mm -hmm. about how appointments have been delivered throughout the, 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 the COVID period. And there's been more face to face than than I think than I yep. thought. Um, so I think that's interesting. And we can share that with our patients and, you know, in our mm -hmm. communities and people that we work with. Um, the call for research is really, really um, helpful. And I think there's some and, and also the stats around um, actually that, that demonstrate that this isn't necessarily a GP driven um, uh, enterprise to move towards mm -hmm. remote consulting. Actually, GPs are, um, for the most part, um, preferring face to face consultations in terms of how they like to um, operate during the day and how mm -hmm. they feel the safest delivering good care to patients. So I think it's, it's, I think it's an, a helpful document and there's space to have these discussions about the business implications as well. And that needs to happen, but I'm not going to rake them over the coals too much for it not being there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but this and came then, out, oh, oh, go on. Yeah. So this also came out before um, the following documents we're going to talk about. So briefly, we're going to talk about Nikki's letter that came out okay. in Pulse today. Um, so it's rare that Nikki makes comments in polls. I must admit, it, you know, for her to give um, these kind of detailed kind of comments and stuff, it, it's not happened that often, probably a lot less than people realised. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so the letter itself, this is the one that's in polls, and we'll be clear on that, and the link is down in the show notes if you want to have a look at it. What do you think, Andy? I think it's really interesting. I, I like stepping back and being a bit meta, you know, about mm -hmm. about what's what's happening. So we have the guidance from the RCGP, then Nikki releases a letter impulse, almost co-signing with the letter that she's signed from NHS England. And actually, in this article, she is um, actually very attuned with what's said in the RCGP paper, mm -hmm. which um, came out before. Um, I just, I, I'm a bit of a conspiracy th theorist. I wonder if there's some coordination in the messaging going on, given how tightly all of these events happen. But she's actually um, very warm about general practices um, response to COVID-19 and the adoption mm -hmm. of new consultation models um, that that's had a, she feels that that's positive. Um, mm -hmm. Then she talks about as the RCGP do, and I think this is a key thing we'll come to the letter um, about the decision for face to face and all the consultation type being uh, made in partnership with the patient. And that's what comes through in the RCGP mm -hmm. document as well, that maybe it's a joint decision about whether um, a face-to-face -face appointment is needed or what consultation type is deployed. And it's very much speaking in terms of uh, partnership um, here. Um, and then she talks about, you know, the opportunities with the technology moving forwards and so forth. Um, so it's interesting. It's almost like someone's trying to achieve balance in terms of the information they're putting out within a single day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes you can read into people's kind of true, true in intentions maybe on what they really want to say. Um, particularly if people put out two different things on the same day that are a little bit different in tone and content. So I just think it's interesting. Okay, so we're talking about tone and content then. Uh, we're going to get to the next one, which is the NHS England um, Standard Operating Procedures for GPs. Um, so this dropped on Thursday night, 13th of May. Um, I saw it something about 7 o'clock in the evening, I think it was. And to say it ruined my day is a bit of an understatement. Um, but yeah. What do you think? I, I, I'd like to know you, your initial reactions. So, right. So, I know you deliberately so, waited to read this, didn't you? Yes, I was going to say. So, um, so I heard, I sort of saw that there was some fuss about this letter from other people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm already a little bit fed up. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to, we're going to talk about this on Saturday. And I thought, I'm going to wait a few days to read it because it's going to wind me up, I think, based mm -hmm. on what other people were saying. Um, I think it's a really interesting letter. It wasn't actually as as bad as I thought it might be, and you know, people can shoot me for this. Um, uh, I, I think it's still neg it's still negative. It's still a misstep. I think the tone mm. is is wrong. Um, but um, it, I didn't have quite as bad an experience reading it as I thought I might do. Um, I think the key points for me um, were okay. It's talking about from the seventeenth of May and linking this advice to the opening yeah. up of the rest of um, 
of other sectors of the economy. So there's not much lead time, is there, to no. to change your your rotors or your appointments or you know what you're doing if you're actually going to comply on that sort of time. time and scale. clarification: this letter is an indicator that the SOP is actually going to change. This is not actually the one that details the standard operating procedure itself. That's still yet to come out. So uh, we, we, we're we're going live at eleven. This is currently eleven forty at the time we are saying this on a Saturday morning. The official standard operating procedures have still not dropped. Bearing in mind this letter identifies that should start from Monday. So I think so it's interesting. It, it half of all general practice appointments during the pandemic have been delivered in person. So it's acknowledging some of the statistics from the RCGP paper. Mm -hmm. Interesting that that's yep. that that's there. It's almost like there's a bit of an effort to achieve a, a bit of balance. Mm -hmm. um, in the letter, I think. GP practices must all ensure they are offering face-to-face -face appointments, underlined, bold. This is a letter that goes out to everyone, isn't it? Not just yep. general practice, the media see this. Uh, what's in bold, I think, is really interesting because that's what the people who wrote the letter want people to see. Um, so, yeah, so they're sort of mandating really that, that there is a clear offer of appointments in, in, in person. Um, and I think this is obviously a response to the public perceptions around access to GP appointments. Yep. And perhaps there are isolated and small cases where access may be not what it should. Um, mm -hmm. But I, don't, I haven't seen those in my no, area, yeah. you know, so, so they must be fairly rare. I'm confident in saying that the area that I look in, look after uh, both as a GP, but also as a clinical director, every single one of the practices I work with have been seeing patients face to face throughout the entire pandemic you know that they have continued to offer those appointments and i guess th this initial paragraph has hearkened a lot to the letter that dropped in september that you know was a turning point i think for many in terms of the relationship with nhs and with the general practice um society shall we say because it seemed to be getting better if i'm being honest you know the engagement everything seems to be going really well and that letter dropped it was clearly designed to appease the media and you know what was going on in, in the wider forms and then there was a massive knock to any form of engagement and cooperation many practices had with nhs england and you could argue that the vaccination program in some ways helped to rebuild it because the vaccination program in itself because of the commitment and the work of general practice has been a success you know we have vaccinated 30 million people have had their first dose that's half the uk population almost have had their first dose of the you know the vaccine in the course of about three four months but this, I think, unfortunately, has it's the tone it is absolutely the tone. So, Gandhi, something that's interesting. So, mm -hmm. um, so chair of Royal College quote, quote quoted here with part of what. So, quote, I'm sure we've said a lot more on this issue because it starts mm -hmm. sort of mid sentence, um, mm -hmm. and the clearly underlined part of what he says. Um, and I just think you know. It's annoying, isn't it, when when what you say gets included in something else and mm -hmm. potentially used for someone else's um, yeah. intentions. Um, I'm just won I'm wondering whether they have permission to quote or not. They well have done, but I just think it's interesting using other people's words uh, and other organisations' words in that letter to that well, effect with that emphasis. The response section that we're talking about after the letter, but yeah, yeah. Um, and then, um, and then the other, the other key bit for me was who decides whether it's a face-to-face -face appointment or not. Yeah. Because I think that's pretty crucial. And I think we've had a lot of success managing the pandemic effectively and deploying these remote methods because the clinician has had uh, some say, you know, in what they feel is an appropriate use of the resource mm -hmm. and what is safe. Sometimes patients don't want to see you, and you want to see them. It's not always a case of um, minimizing face-to-face -face contact. Completely um, agree. And so there's a clear emphasis here on leaning towards patient choice. I think practices should respect preferences to face to face care unless there are good clinical reasons to the contrary. So that's actually quite different to the tone of Nikki's letter in Pulse and um, the RCGP um, paper and associated mm -hmm. recommendations that came out with it, which called for a partnership, which I think is fine, you know, a, a shared decision about what to do in terms of the management plan of a patient, that's pretty bread and butter, you know, yeah. for, for, for general practice, we are trained to do that. Um, this is giving the message to the profession and the wider country that 
Um, you know, if you if you want a face to face appointment, you can put your feet down and ask for one, and they should give you one. Is sort of the tone, <laughs> the tone that comes really? to. So I think that that's perhaps the most controversial thing in here. For me. I don't know. What do you think, oh. Andy? So that's definitely one of the key points. I think the second one is this concept of reception being open. Uh, and yeah. I know that's caused, so that's the second, is it second paragraph? No, third paragraph, there we are. It's down here. Yeah, it's these yeah. two points. Yeah. So, you know, this concept that receptions have not been open, um, they have, they've just had, um, in a lot of places, they've had systems whereby they're trying to limit the flow of people coming into the environment because it's not been safe for, you know, numerous people to walk into a GP practice. Because let's be honest, majority of GP practices are small reception areas which can't easily social distance en masse with the amount of work footfall they would have seen pre-pandemic. That, that's a given. We know that. Which attract people who are sick yep. and people who are vulnerable um, mm. because of their medical conditions or social situation. Um, so there has been the potential for G GP practice could have been awful places for the spreading of coronavirus. Um, mm. But they weren't because we were, you know, we were able to move a lot of that reception activity yeah. to to telephones. But yeah, I, they're calling I for all receptions to be open. And I think there's definitely something about practice making sure they're getting the messaging right to patients in terms of what the the fact that the, the entrance way is um, stuttered or closed or whatever they want to call it, um, you know, to limit that flow of patients. I think practices need to make sure they've got that messaging right and communicating with patients about why that's the case. But it's important to remember that that was done. A, the advice of NHS England again, and um, B, because it's the safe and the right thing to do to safeguard not only individual patients, but the populations we look after, and C, to safeguard the staff so we can keep functioning. You know, when the pandemic hit, there were actually, unfortunately, some practices that had to shut because patients with COVID-based symptoms walked in and then subsequently infected other patients and staff members. And that's why we're having to do this. And yes, the rates are different to what they were at the start of the pandemic. However, we're hearing about the Indian variant causing a resurgence and concerns around that. We are not out of the woods at this point. And it's important that we're making sure that we're still managing things safely, both for our staff, but also for other patients as well, as well as obviously the individual patient that, you know, that's walking through the door. Yeah, I think this right. could have been I think this could have been softer and yeah. I acknowledge that. Perhaps some practices may be able to do this because of their building and their setup mm -hmm. and the area that they work um, and COVID levels and you know other issues in that area. And some practices it may still be unsafe to do it, mm -hmm. or it may be unsafe in three weeks' time, you know, to 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 do it, and it may be safe now. So I think um, yes, this not could have afforded one working day to action a plan that we still don't have full details on. Yeah, could have afforded practices more flexibility. Practices, you know, trust practices essentially. You know, mm -hmm. It could be more and trust. I think there's definitely some comments coming through. So, you know, again, we've had someone mention about, you know, how can they justify opening reception areas with a surge in the Indian variant, which just last night, Boris Johnson came out on TV and said, we need to be cautious and it may halt all the other plans. And yet this is a few hours after NHS England have sent out a letter instructing general practice they need to significantly change the way they're doing to appease patient want versus patient need. Um, and they are two separate things. Absolutely. But there is some positive stuff in, the, in there because um, it does talk about potential support and we're going to talk about that now. Um, so in terms of the letter, I'm actually one thing I am impressed with is the communication with the patients annex part. It is actually quite good. And I, I'm guessing a lot of people probably haven't looked at it because they've been so distracted by the rest of the letter. Um, but this particular section, the detail and the support and the information that you can use to help share with your patients about that stuff that we just talked about is actually quite good. So if you do want to have a look at those links, feel free to do so. It's it's not bad, if I'm being honest. And that's with me, me with my social media hat on as well, talking about it. And so definitely worth that. But it also talks about other support to practices as well in terms of managing the workload. What did you think of this, Andy? So I, I'm wondering why this is here. So I've got my, mm -hmm. my meta hat on. And I think uh, it's a bit, I, I wonder how helpful it is yet as mm -hmm. well. And uh, it, it sort of is a little bit of, oh, look how much help your GP, your GP surgery is getting in mm -hmm. order to do what, what we are asking them to do, potentially, given that part of the audience for this is the media and you know, the public at, at large. They talk about the PCNARS roles to facilitate this return to um, you know, face to face GP consultations. Yeah. Um, I don't think general GPs are an ARRS role unless things have changed. 
overnight mm-hmm. or will change in the future for for example um so uh and i think general practice generally knows about a lot of these schemes you know that are in place so i just wonder why this section is there um mm. I'm not sure. And I think you made a couple of valid points. So the IRS roles, I, th- I think, overall to general practices can potentially be helpful. Um, it mentioned about 12 to 13 full-time equivalents per network. I don't know any network in the Nottingham City area that's managed to achieve that level of um, employment at this point. Um, and that's because mainly there aren't that number of staff around, um, those people in those roles. Um, but also what it doesn't mention is the amount of GP time it takes, therefore, to manage those roles. So particularly in terms of supervision, estates, key issues that aren't addressed in terms of the, the support and funding with a lot of the ARS roles. That's both me and you talking as PCN clinical directors with knowledge of that particular area. It's a massive challenge, particularly in, in our localities and stuff. Um, and it has limited the amount of availability we can provide to practices and networks in terms of the, the resource that they mention there. The Fellowships to uh, nurses and GPs, I think that's something that some areas have, have had real benefit from, some areas probably not so much. Similarly, with the returners to the workforce and things, um, it's variable in terms of how much benefit it's had. You know, there's the whole CCAS um, stuff of GPs coming back to work for that area. And actually, then you hear loads of GPs saying that it took them a significant amount of time and effort to, to onboard and still weren't able to do anything meaningful as a result of it. So bureaucracy, unfortunately, taking over. A little bit about the vaccination schemes and, and support for that, but how is that working? Well, I, I will maintain general practice is the reason that the vaccination scheme has been anywhere near as successful as it has been on a shoestring budget. It just pulls resources away from our ability to deliver appointments, doesn't it? So I'm not quite sure that that is actually helpful. But It's not. You know, in terms of what it's asking us to do, which is see more patients, then actually the vaccination scheme is actually limiting that. Um, and, you know, many will argue that the funding for it has not been anywhere enough to manage the workload that's come through and it talks about individual support and group team support that is potentially available which is kind of nice it doesn't change the workload coming through the door though um and then support for changing how you work things like the access improvement schemes time to care that kind of stuff which again nice to have trying to do that when you've got double the amount of demand coming through your door and then being told that you now need to see all those face to face because somebody wants to be seen face to face yeah gandhi go can for I, it can i talk about um about nikki for a second okay so yeah so so i've not had a because i think again i'm i'm stepping back and looking at the bigger the bigger picture here and um some things puzzle me about what's been happening um, okay. uh, particularly around this letter and maybe the other letter as well uh, and i've not had an an opportunity to talk to Nikki. We don't have that kind of relationship, um, but that means I can speak freely, you know, um, about about what I think, you know, might be going on, or just, you know, just sort of step back a little bit, really, and ask a few questions. Because um, Nikki's actually demonstrated really good, positive engagement with the profession over the course of the last year or mm-hmm. more, in my opinion, um, and um, actually appears to have good emotional intelligence and understands the importance and nuances around messaging and okay. you know how things are delivered and how things are received and what happens when you do that um and so so it puzzles me that and she had a, a previously poorly received letter you know earlier in the year as well mm-hmm. so it just puzzles me how this has come to happen again um and also she put out this article in Pulse you know, at the same time, which actually is different in tone to the letter that she put out on the same day. Mm-hmm. And um, I know she's getting a lot of flack for this, and I'm just going to give an alternative viewpoint here um, that, um, you know, actually sometimes, um, but I, so GP appointments have become a really big, it's a big political football, isn't it? It's something that yeah. the public care about, make noise about, and that's almost irresistible for politicians um, or even, you know, the heads of big organizations like the Department of Health or NHS England to ignore because of the way the pressures are set up in our democracy. So I think there's a bigger political game going on here. And uh, one thing that struck me when I read the letter after a delay was it could have could have been worse or it wasn't quite as bad as I thought it okay. could have been or was going to be. Um, 
And I just wonder, sometimes, you know, people are in difficult positions, aren't they? And they think, well, I don't like what's happening here, but maybe remaining in this position allows me to mitigate or still have some influence on the situation in a way that other people that might stand in these shoes might not be motivated or able to. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wonder, you know, if, you know, Nikki is maybe trying harder than we think to protect and influence things positively for general practice. It's just a different alternative reading of the situation that may not be popular, may not be true, but I just wonder. And um, I'm going to put a bit of a classics hat on here. And mm. um, this, this, this comparison is, is not, is not, um, is not particularly valid, but um, um, uh, so, you know, people talk about, so Seneca, why is this man of his time in ancient Rome, um, okay. Stoic philosopher, um, he uh, stayed with Nero, uh, who was a disastrous emperor in mm-hmm. Rome, um, and was one of his closest advisors and counsels. And that did him a lot of reputational damage, both at the time and in history. And people say, why did he do it? And there's always a mm-hmm. debate about this. Um, and people think, actually, sometimes, you know, good people, you know, work within organizations that aren't doing what they agree with to try and limit an influence and you know sometimes that's a positive mm-hmm. thing but it's a little bit thankless so i was just throwing in an alternative perspective i also remember um when helen stokes lampard was criticized for um for having a photo with jeremy hunt with an rcgp mug um yeah, and that I was a big that. deal a few fact, years I think ago that was um related to one of the events we were part of as well i think it was yeah it was yeah. anyway i just remember that photo and she got some flack for that and for not being as for the RCGP under her leadership, not being as critical of Jeremy Hunt and the Department of Health as they could have been. Mm-hmm. But actually, she seemed to develop a good relationship with Jeremy Hunt. They were both smiling in the picture. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, after that, some of the rhetoric around general practice changed coming out of the government. And um, and we got the GP forward view, which actually did represent an increase in funding for general practice. So I don't know. I think sometimes our leaders play um, a difficult game so i just wanted to give an alternative perspective on Nikki. yeah i, I think there's that element the of at what point does representing an organization become a balance point of the individual aims and targets of, of the person versus the organizational ones and i know it's a, a line you and i've had to uh, deal with as pcn clinical directors you know uh, i I'm not, i won't deny i've had to make decisions that may have would have benefited the PCN, so the organization of the group of practices, but may not specifically have benefited individual practices or individuals within them because of the implications of that. But it, those decisions were made with the view that hopefully that's the best for the organization. That perception, I think, is, is stuff that is always going to be different on different sides of it. Um, I think, you know, the, the letter is damaging. I don't think there's any way to, to disagree with that in, and who it's damaging to. Yeah, hard hard to clarify. There have been numerous responses though to, to this yeah. letter. I think that that speaks towards the the vociferousness and, and the impact it's had. So we're gonna have a little look at those now. Um there's a couple we're gonna identify. Um so one that I would highly recommend people have a look at is the Cambridge LMC letter. It, it's kind of similar to a couple of other ones that are existing, but um the reason why I definitely recommend having a look at this is because it does identify a couple of key points. And it's written by Dr. Katie Bramall-Stainer, who is absolutely amazing. I highly recommend ever listening to anything that Katie says. Um, but effectively, the key point is that um, it does state that the NHS SOP letter is guidance. It is not contractual. That's the first and massive thing it states out. And it does state out what your contractual obligations are, which I think any GP that have read the SOP letter, this is the one that you also need to then contrast that with because it makes it clear what you should currently be doing until we get further details and stuff um at this point in time um and it then also goes through various offers of support and you know um how you may want to um manage things further it, it's it's a good letter um we also have i guess one from our own lmc that, that, let's, ha- let's highlight the i think this is key so you're not obligated obli- they in their interpretation of the regulations which they provide yeah. um, below, you're not obliged to offer a face-to-face appointment solely on the request of a patient. That's their interpretation in Cambridgeshire. Great, and that is part of the GMS contract. Um, so that is the contract by which you know general practice provided services provided to patients. Um, I know that. So interestingly, I, I discussed this on Twitter, and I think as Sam Shah, who, who's um, 
really, I really respect him in terms of his uh, digital knowledge and, and stuff like that. He identified that there was another line in the contract that potentially says that the NHS England can unilaterally change the co- contract however they see fit. Um, is this a change in contract? Well, if it is, then the BMA need to bloody well be saying so, to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we haven't got to that stage yet because, and we're going to get to their responses in a second. Um, we also showing our not- local Nottinghamshire LMC response letter, which is pretty good. Um, Bit more Gandhi, detail. I've not, Gandhi, I've not I've not read it. What's the what's the take home? Is it different in any way to Cambridge's um, response? The the themes are the same. I guess the reason why I slightly prefer the Cambridge one is it just outlines the the details a bit clearer. It does kind of talk about in bullet points a bit later on and stuff. Um and it, it's definitely written, I think, with a bit more passion in terms of um local areas, but then slight decoration. I'm part of that LMC, so I've kind of will say that. <laughs> um but you know, I, I think they are strong responses is probably the best way i would describe them to the situation speaking of strong responses uh, yeah so that's in contrast to i think what the rcgp have put out and i would say that this is not a strong response um again pointing out i'm a national representative of the rcgp council um as a declaration there um but i i read this and I'm, i must admit i felt that this was not the kind of response i would expect from my college that's my personal and absolutely unilateral view of, on that point Partly because it just seems to say that look at the work we did on the future remote consultations point. It, it just says, yeah, that the, the letter identifies that we've done some really cool work on that, and, and that's what you need to look at. Yeah, that, that was my brain. Yeah, it it draws a lot from the their publication earlier in, in mm-hmm. the week. I think um, I think it's very diplomatic, and as I say, I think the timing is interesting. I, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the RCGP in some way um in on this sequence of events i don't know that's 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 really controversial actually maybe i i shouldn't even whisper these words um i don't I actually don't I actually don't think so but i think they had a lot queued up to say about their research which they which they'd done in their paper yeah and, you know and it was an opportunity for them to get that out so i think they'd sort of come at it from that perspective already wanting to say a lot of what they ended up saying um, in response to it. But yeah, it was diplomatic and sometimes things can be, you know, less diplomatic and need to be more impactful. Mm-hmm. And then we've also had the BMA response as well, which has, I'd put it more as a holding response is my perception of it. Um, it, it is stronger. Uh, I can't remember the exact term that Richard Vulture used, but it was, I think it, they said that the letter was tone deaf or something like that from NHS England. Um, tone deaf, badly judged. Stronger yeah. than the RCGP response, definitely. Yes. But I, again, I see that as a holding statement. I'm, I'm suspecting that there will probably be something more that comes out from the BMA, possibly when the official SOP comes out. Um, and I, I anxiously await that letter to see how my union is going to respond to what seems like a fairly negative instruction from NHS England. Um, but yeah, time will And also be- the effects it has on public perception of the profession and what it's been doing yep. as well, which I think is... And I think that's the key thing. Unfortunately, this letter seems to have been written for public perception it has not been written to help manage healthcare. Um, it is, you know, it seems to come across as a response to the Daily Mail and, and other reports that we've seen about again who shouts loudest um, and not respecting or acknowledging in significant detail the amount of effort and work that is currently and has been done over the past year and a half, almost in terms of what's been delivered by general practice and healthcare professionals. And the system, to be honest, I mean, look at what we've done in the past year. We have rapidly changed the way that general practice has been functioning to support um, patient care in a time of unprecedented elements of you know, challenge. We have then done a national flu campaign on top of that, and then a COVID vaccination campaign on top of that. Um, in spite of all the challenges of practice have had to face in terms of self-isolation, business continuity, and mental well-being, um, and then now we're dealing with the fallout from all of that, the significant mental burden of lockdown and everything that's happened, the physical burden of patients having to hold on to their symptoms for the past year, the fact that secondary care services are nowhere near capable of dealing with the fallout from all of this. You know, half of my consultations at the moment are patients that are coming back to us after having to wait to see the hospital and, you know, reach the limit of what I can offer them in terms of general practice care and that's really challenging to deal with when i don't have an option to send them to but the place they can come to is me 
and my practice. Andy, I've got a point to make. So Go for uh, it. I'm just wondering when when are NHS England going to write to the hospitals and and tell the hospitals to to start doing face to face appointments with patients and clear their backlog? Oh, I, we probably won't see that letter. I think is is the answer. Um, and it raises that question: why, why, why is that letter not written to the NHS? Why is it focusing on GPs? Why did they feel they had to tar every practice across the entire country with a brush that penalizes them and makes them feel and look a lot worse than the majority of practices have been doing? And it's a definite contrast to the September letter because the September letter, when you went into the detail, did identify that, that was being written for a small minority of practices. This one is not. This one is written to the profession itself. And I think that's where a lot of people have felt, um, you know, real offence in, in some ways to this particular letter because it is lambasting the entire profession with a massive brush about the fact that we haven't been doing a job when absolutely every person I know working across primary care has been working themselves to the bone to help everyone else. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm not going to use as passionate language as you, Gandhi, but <laughs> basically it, it, it reinforces the negative perceptions that are already out there in in the public at large about mm -hmm. general practice and that's not a nice thing to do to part of your workforce um to do that you know the the nhs england have basically um almost pushed maybe this is emotive you know pushed gps under the bus a little bit in mm -hmm. terms of uh saying you know just actually validating those negative perceptions so they could have they could have challenged them they could have asked us to do the same thing but challenge the perceptions a little bit more uh, and that would have built more trust. And I think, um, you know, we talked about um, reputational um, currency and how you spend mm. it and eventually you run out of it. And that's when you struggle because the relationship's damaged. And the NHS England have been running on empty in their relationship capital with general practice for a long time. And this just, just further reinforces that issue. Um, Rena, yeah. that's just an excellent point. Excellent point about hospitals. We're doing all their bloods. Um, that is happening a little bit, isn't it, locally? It is. Well. And I think this is something that patients tend to forget because of the way that structures and everything works, that, you know, general practice has been taking over a lot of the workload from the secondary care system because the secondary care system, quite rightly in some places, has had to change. You know, they've had to deal with the acute complexities of COVID, you know, significant numbers of patients on ICU units needing oxygen. And because of that, they have done an amazing job. Outpatient departments have changed and still continue to be really stunted and slow. Um, and some are appropriately so, and I think, unfortunately, some not so. Um, are we going to tar all secondary care consultants you know, and, and practices and stuff with the same brush? I'd hope not. Um, I, Gandhi, I Gandhi we're, we're better than that. Yeah. We are. Yeah, I, I'd hope not. I, I won't deny, uh, you know, nine o'clock in the evening when I'm still in practice, dealing with a letter from a consultant asking me to do their bloods that they could have just sent to the patient directly. Have I got frustrated and potentially sent out something? I probably might have thought, well, I wouldn't have done that if I was in a different time. I'm not going to die. That's happened. Um, and yeah, but you, you, didn't, you, didn't, you probably didn't write a public letter to all NHS consultants That's accusing them of doing the, the same thing and, and, to the and send it to the media yeah. and the public as well at the same time. You probably absolutely. didn't do that. No, I didn't do that. Um, have I done it on my Twitter feeds potentially? And absolutely, I probably have done. Have I regretted it? No, because it was true emotion. And I, I always make sure I say whatever I mean. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it's definitely a situation that is completely forgotten in this letter. Um, the fact that general practice is suffering because of the fact that it's not just what general practice is doing. Um, and I, I, I don't understand why they feel they can pick and penalize in general practice over the rest of the NHS. Is it just because we are the all you can eat buffet um, and the easiest one to pick apart? Maybe. I don't know. Gandhi, I'm going to say something positive. Because I want to be in a good mood when I go to Ikea this afternoon. And <laughs> that positive thing is and actually... Why are you do, going to Ikea on a Saturday? That is so just I'm, asking for pain. I, I work during the day, in the daytime, in the week. Um, fair enough. I don't want to go in the evening. It's because I work in the evenings as well. Yeah, fair enough. Like most GPs. Um, so actually, the, the piece of work from the RCGP about online consultations, um, I think, was actually good, positive, there were some really good insights into the way we've been consulting over the past year. Lots of real stats that we can share with um, with patients. Um, shone a light on actually what the profession seems to think about online consultations versus face-to-face -face and that it's not us driving this. 
um, and you know, call uh, has some good recommendations for the future, including calling for more research into the actual effects they have, which I think is great. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Q and A's. We've had yeah. so we've had some useful comments. Um, so digital health coach has popped on about the fact that um, I think number ten overrode Matt Hancock. So again, this is an interesting um, point. To this Matt Hancock himself, so the Secretary of State for Health, has repeatedly stated that total triage, telephone first, digital first, is the route to go. And all of a sudden, there is a massive U-turn in a really short time frame. So has he actually been overridden by number ten? Has he been overridden by something else? Um, it's an interesting point to make. It seems at odds with the, the direction of travel that we've been repeatedly told over the past year that this is how you should be doing things. Um, classic, classic, classic. Um, flip flop. It, it would be in line with behavior with number 10. I mean, because often mm -hmm. when an issue um, really captures the public, um, you know, heart and perceptions, they will step in and take executive decisions, won't they? They're looking at yep. the European Super League for football and so forth. So I think they've got form for behaving in that way. Absolutely. Which is questionable and um, serena makes a point about how do we therefore manage um patient queries when it comes do we have to say to them do you want telephone video or face to face um i think you know the guidance from the lmcs is clear that you still operate in the way that is best suited for the practice and for the patient's individual needs um in line with your gms contract um and you know clinicians are in some ways best place to help derive that in combination with patients but that doesn't mean that you offer everything and anything because there's a there is a capacity issue, but let's be absolutely honest on this. You cannot, at this moment in time, offer every consultation as a face to face with the current demand that general practice is facing. It's just impossible to do. And anybody who feels that they can do that and that they're saying they can do that, tell us how. Seriously, show us how you're doing that. Because I know we could not do that in my practice. We could not offer everybody a face to face appointment just because they want one. Um, need one? Absolutely. We will make sure that whoever needs a face-to-face -face contact will get one in a timely way. Want one? No, not going to happen. Can't happen. We just don't have that ability. Not funded to do so. More coming through. So a uh, digital health coach mentions about what's missing from the debate. I feel is better management of phones and linking up controls and inflow con across the incoming channels. Yet we've already identified the tech needs to work with that. And there are some really cool solutions out there to try and help. But again, those solutions take time to implement and to adjust to. And it's you know, a challenging one to, to, to do straight away. And there's some more negative ones in there. Um, things about, you know, they don't care about us as political scoring. Secondary care ought to do their own blood. Okay. You know, we didn't make these points to, to kind of, you know, bag on as our secondary care colleagues, you know, I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. They, they've had just as much of a challenge. This is a system approach we need. This is not identifying one part of it. The system needs to respond. And that part of that system is NHS England. And in my view, they need to take ownership of the fact that that letter is not right. It needs rewriting, it needs republishing. It needs to be apologized for as well. But hey, I'm just one voice. Sorry, so, <laughs> as that. But are we reaching a nat natural conclusion to? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. To I, I think we're still keen to hear what people think. Uh, and if people do want to put any comments or questions, feel free to do so down below in the chat and stuff, and we'll happily try and answer them after the effect. I think this is a debate that's going to continue, and um, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out over the next week in particular. Um, but more importantly, how remote consultations in the future of them looks for general practice. Are they still going to be here? Absolutely. I know many practices that will not want to go back to a face-to-face -face first model for general practice. And there are also going to be some practices that feel that's the best way to manage themselves and manage their patient care. Fine. You work with the best that suits your individual population because that's actually what healthcare is meant to be about, you know, delivering the best healthcare to your local population's need. Um, and Absolutely. Tailored to the individual. Yeah. Yeah. Is that not, not mandated? Not mandated from on high. Not mandated from on there high. There we go. Because that is not appropriate or correct. And as we move out of a COVID, you know, well, well, we're not in a COVID level four situation anymore. But you know, how strong are the abilities of NHS England to mandate how we do things? I don't know. Devil's advocate there. <laughs> as always, EGP, if you do have any comments or questions, let us know. More than happy to try and answer them as best as we can for you. And feel free to stick those comments down below. If you have found this useful, please, please, please leave us a like. Um, it really lets us know if this content is effective and stuff for you. We've got amazing stuff coming up over the next few weeks for you as well. And absolutely, if you haven't done so, sign up for the TPP. Um, 
at System One Facebook Users Group conference that's coming on the 30th of June, which you are going to love. There's some awesome stuff coming for that. We've got more content. If you want to have a look, check out this video right here that's going to give you more details about online consultation and the sustainability. If not, YouTube's probably recommending another one for you right here ish somewhere, potentially. And as always, EGP Learn 